This is a program about the ways that iron and steel get used in buildings. It's not a topic that I've ever made a whole program about before, but it's a subject that has pushed itself into loads and loads of the other programs I've made, as you can see. So, lots of interesting irony things about but not a lot of them on display here. I hear you moan. This is the village of Great Salkeld in the Eden Valley between Carlisle and Penrith. A very pretty place. A traditional bit of old England where traditional materials like stone still rule the roost. And that's the way we heritage lovers like it to be. But actually, even here, there is the odd thing made of iron. There are some very nice wrought iron garden gates. And there's a cast iron telephone kiosk. Designed in 1935, you might be interested to know, by Giles Gilbert Scott, the architect of Liverpool Cathedral and known as the K6 model. Call me a pathetic old fuddy duddy. Oh, thank you. But I still regret the loss of these old telephone boxes. I think it was an act of mindless vandalism to replace something so utterly English with the bland designs we find all over nowadays. OK, maybe mindless vandalism's a bit strong, but it still saddens me. I bet this one got listed, and that's why it's still here. It's not why we're here, though. We're here because of the church and the Scots. You need to know a little bit of history. And that's all you're going to get because I don't know a lot myself. But the village is very ancient. And after the Norman conquest, it was given by William the Conqueror to one of his followers. Eventually, Great Salkeld was given as a present to Alexander II, who was the King of Scotland in the early 1200s. I hope this isn't too boring, but Alexander fell out with King John and he lost all of his properties in northern England. So once again, Great Salkeld became English. It was like a ping-pong ball. Great Salkeld, the ping-pong village. It's got a certain ring to it. English, Scots, English, everybody claimed it, and that's why the church is the way that it is. Fortified. Maybe it's not obvious from here, but that tower is like a castle tower. Tall and strong and unbuttressed, with no windows. Well, just tiny ones. That little turret sticking out all the way up in the corner is a pretty clear indication that it's got a spiral staircase inside. But there's also something else which I've brought you to see which is not only extraordinary, but also made of iron. It's a yacht. Are you telling me that you don't know what a yacht is? Well, you've obviously never sat at my mother's knee and heard her recite the Cumbrian rhyme, Hast you ever seen a cuddy lope a yacht? Well, it must have been a lish cuddy and a lyle yacht. You look puzzled. Well, it goes, Hast you ever seen a cuddy lope a yacht? It must have been a lish cuddy and a lyle yacht. This is a yacht. A yacht's a gate, in this case a gate of iron, to protect the people sheltering inside the tower from the wrath of attackers. It was made six or seven hundred years ago by a blacksmith and it's massively strong as you can see. It's got huge hinges and powerful bolts and it's rare. I can only think of four other medieval ones like it in England, though there are probably others that I don't know about. But doors, hinges and bolts are among the few ways that I can think of that iron was used as part of architecture in the Middle Ages. But just occasionally, as I showed you in one of the earlier programmes in this series, the blacksmith used his skill to turn the solid workaday quality of iron into something more fantastic. The 900-year-old door in Stillingfleet Church in Yorkshire is a fabulous riot of primitive ironwork full of dragons and Viking-style ships.
And while we're on the subject of programmes earlier in the series, we came here to Benningborough in North Yorkshire a few weeks ago to look at its fabulous staircase. It's wooden staircase, that is, because on that occasion I failed to reveal to you that the house has got a second staircase round the back, which is made of iron. I was saving it up for this programme, and here it is, the back staircase at Benningborough, dating, like the rest of the house, from about 1716. Back stairs were the stairs that the servants used, and the other less important people, and you can tell that these are back stairs, because they're steep and narrow, much more difficult to walk up than the main stairs, and there's no posh decoration on the stairwell either. But it's still a gorgeous flight, isn't it? You know, I think I like it almost better than the main staircase, but that's probably because I'm a natural servant. I wasn't born to be one of the beautiful people. But the carved detail of the treads is so strong and the angle is just right and the iron balustrade. Oh, how simple and elegant is that? All handmade, of course, probably by a country blacksmith. You can tell that it's handmade locally because it's not quite spot on. I'm right, aren't I? These are sort of outline urn shapes, but they're not quite symmetrical. And the curly, flowery things aren't perfect either. And you can see the hammer marks too. But I think that the slightly freeform quality is part of its charm. Near the top of the stairs, there's another bit of ironwork which was done about the same time, still 1716-ish, but this is of quite a different quality. This is part of the posh people's world, part of the public areas of the house, and it is of quite fabulous quality. It's still hand done, of course, but to such a standard of perfection. This is the Baroque style, which is often heavy and exaggerated, but this is so delicate and light-hearted, you could really call it Rococo. I sometimes feel a bit shocked when I think about how much wealth was poured into a house like this, how much it cost to provide staircases like those. But at least the owners in those days left us pieces of perfection to enjoy forever. Try buying a celebrity magazine nowadays and see what sort of quality today's super rich spend their money on, hmm? Flashy tat by comparison, he said rather controversially. All the things that I've shown you so far are the sort of things that would have been made by a blacksmith. And like the things that blacksmiths still make today, they've fallen into two categories. There are solid, practical and workaday things, hinges and bolts, tough, strong things. And there are decorative things with curly bits. It's always amused me that blacksmiths are such tough, manly chaps, but they like nothing better than to tease delicate twiddly bits out of the metal. Tough, manly chaps with sore. Of course, blacksmiths don't make iron, they make things out of iron, so that means that there are iron makers who mine the ore and own the blast furnaces. And one family of such men lived here in the 1700s at Lindale in Cartmel near Bruff by Sands. They were called the Wilkinsons. There was Daddy Wilkinson, who was called Isaac, and there was his son John, whose monument this is. Do you notice anything special about it? It's made of cast iron. and it commemorates a man whose life was defined by iron. In fact, he was known when he was alive as Iron Mad Wilkinson. He was involved in the first steam engines and heavily involved in the first iron bridge. In 1787, he launched the first iron boat, a canal barge. He devised new ways of making iron and new ways of casting cannons. He tried to make some iron shoes, but you won't be surprised to learn that they weren't awfully comfortable. He insisted upon being buried in an iron coffin, 
and he designed and made this iron obelisk to go over his own grave. He sounds a bit potty when you describe him in the way that I just have, but in fact he was typical of his time, because more and more people all over the country, and especially all over the north, were thinking of different ways to use this material. In 1808, when Iron Mad Wilkinson died, the world was going iron mad too, and that's because the Industrial Revolution was in full flow. The quiet, traditional villages of England looked like being submerged in a flood of iron. The use of iron during the Industrial Revolution affected the most unexpected sorts of buildings, and not many areas of life escaped the iron flow. In 1812, John Cragg, the owner of the Mersey Iron Foundry, persuaded the architect Thomas Rickman to design him two iron churches in Liverpool. This is the one at St Michael's in the Hamlet in Toxteth. Parts of the outer walls are built traditionally of brick, but everything else, including the whole of the astonishing interior, was cast out of iron at Cragg's factory. The inspiration was almost certainly twofold. The churches were a standing advert for the product, but there was also a passion for this new, emerging material. But of course it was in the field of industry that the iron was most obvious. First of all came the new mills, traditional enough in appearance and outward construction, but filled with iron inside. Iron columns and beams used in an attempt to make the mills more fireproof and fast rooms filled with the violent clamour of iron looms as well. And then the railways were about to burst on the scene, which meant not only the glorious power of the locomotives themselves, but the rails stretching away into infinity, and the stations too, a whole new world of iron. Sometimes the iron is used in astonishingly pretty ways, as if the engineers constructing this brand new railway world were desperate not to frighten people, but to reassure them that the railways could fit in comfortably with the traditional world they were invading. But the great stations are a different kettle of fish and the north has just got so many of them. There's Liverpool Lime Street and Manchester Central, that's GMEX as was, and there's Newcastle, but I've chosen to come this time to York because, well, because it's superb. Not so much from outside, fairly ordinary from outside, but the train shed is fantastic. It was designed by a man called Thomas Prosser, which for reasons I'm not prepared to go into is a name that always makes me snigger. But he was good, because like all of these Victorian railway masterpieces, this is great architecture and great engineering combined. It's huge for a start, 800 metres long. I wonder if it was the longest building in the world at the time. And the engineering of the roof, those great curved wrought iron beams which had been invented 20 years earlier at Newcastle Station still seem as modern as the day they were put up. But the shape, the great dynamic curve of the roof and platforms, and the details, the beauty of the cast iron Corinthian columns, it all makes for great architecture too. And now bridges. Bridges were another of the classes of building that were to be profoundly affected by the taste for iron. The world's first iron bridge was built by Abraham Darby over the River Severn in 1779. Our Iron Mad Wilkinson, you might recall, was heavily involved in its birth. But Iron Bridge is far from the north, so in a spirit of local patriotism, we turn instead to Sunderland. Sunderland had the second great iron bridge of history. It was opened in 1796 and it was a masterpiece. It was superbly elegant. It was a single arch of 236 feet, by far the widest single span arch in existence at the time. People travelled from all over the world to see it. Not anymore, sadly, because it was replaced in 1928 and that leaves 
This bridge, I think, has the oldest surviving iron bridge in the north. It's called the Union Chain Bridge because it unites England and indeed Scotland. It was designed in 1819 by a man called Captain Samuel Brown RN. The RN bit stands for Royal Navy and while he was in the Navy he started to experiment with iron rigging for ships but this was his first bridge. By no means the first suspension bridge because they had existed for centuries and not actually the first iron one. A man called James White had built several in America though none lasted very long. One of them collapsed in a couple of years under the weight of a herd of cattle and another one under the weight of a wagon covered with snow. This one has shown that it's strong enough to survive the most extreme loads and to keep on doing so for almost 200 years so far. What Samuel Brown invented specifically were these wrought iron chain links, just a couple of inches thick, but strong enough to keep this bridge going, even though it was by far the longest such bridge ever built, 480 feet long and wide enough to continue to function as a modern road. The thing about this bridge is that it's an example of blue sky thinking. Let's get rid of the past and see what metal can do for us, see what iron can do for us, and steel of course, because eventually steel took over from iron. In bridge building, it was an approach that led to some of the North's most powerful and original structures. <laughs> that these programs are not just thrown together let me point out that the last structure you saw in that nice little montage was called the Barton Swing Bridge and here I am in the middle of Manchester about to take you into the Barton Arcade how creative a link is that eh and what a creative building or is it Mm. You see, this was put up in 1874 by a company called Corbett Raby and Savage but to be honest, they pretty well bought it off the peg. It was made by a Glasgow company called the McFarlane Saracen Glass Company, who had developed a way of manufacturing system buildings which could be prefabricated on site. It was like Lego, you just bought the bits and slotted them together. But what bits and what a glorious effect it creates. I find it completely magical. Arcades like this were invented in Paris earlier in the 19th century and their history contains so many things that you could talk about. Glass, for example. Affordable plate glass was invented about 1830. Before then it had been hugely expensive. But there was still a window tax until 1845, so glass buildings like this didn't really appear until after that. And of course it's iron that made them possible. Not so much the pretty decorative panels, but the iron columns behind the facade. Iron that's light enough to be almost invisible, but strong enough to keep the whole thing up. Some 19th century architects disapproved of all this, especially those who were purists for truth in architecture, like Augustus Pugin, the architect of the Houses of Parliament. They felt that plate glass windows were a sort of deception because you couldn't tell what was keeping the building up. They didn't like the idea that the outer walls were just a sort of skin that hung upon the iron frame inside. Ten years before the Barton Arcade was built in 1864, Oriel Chambers in Liverpool was among the first buildings in the world to have a thin outer skin of largely glass supported by an invisible iron frame. It looks fairly conventional from outside, Big windows, but recognisably Victorian. It's only when you get inside that you can see that it's really a metal frame which keeps the whole building up. That was a revolution in 1864, but now, of course, we just take it for granted. We don't bat an eyelid when we see a steel frame going up. We know that we're not going to see it when the building's completed. 
We know that the strength and lightness of the steel frame allows extraordinary and impossible things to happen. New and unheard of shapes, height, lightness, beauty. Well, I would say beauty. I know that some aren't quite so sure. So one direction that iron, or more commonly steel nowadays, has gone in buildings is into the background, lurking humbly in the shadows in a sort of supporting role. But even today, some architects still use it in a different way. The roof of Gateshead Sage Music Centre is made of stainless steel, which shimmers and reflects the sky and is a decorative feature in its own right. The gates at Millennium Bridge uses steel in much the same way as the Union Bridge used iron, and the effect is just as exciting and sculptural as that historic suspension bridge. And at the entrance to the Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art, weathered steel is used as a decorative feature. It's a wonderful colour and a wonderful texture, and interestingly, it's exactly the same material that Anthony Gormley used in The Angel of the North. Good to see that irony, steely stuff is still being used for its beauty as well as its strength. <laughs>